Good evening and welcome to the session tonight. Thank you for joining me this evening. My name's Ella Beartu and I am a bibliotherapist and also an artist. Many of you may not have heard the term bibliotherapist before. Many of you will have. But if you haven't, I will now explain what bibliotherapy is. Bibliotherapy is the art of prescribing fiction to cure life's ailments. And it's something which me and my friend Susan Elderkin thought we had invented when we met at Cambridge University quite a few years ago. And we, when we were at university together, both studying English literature, we used to give each other books in order to cure each other's problems. So if one of us had a problem such as a broken heart or an inability to finish an essay, we would leave a book for the other person outside their door because we actually had adjacent rooms when we were at college together. And we spent those years healing each other's problems by giving each other the right books to read at the right time in our lives. And we used to talk then about how we ought to become book doctors, which we also thought that we had completely invented as a concept. We used to talk about being a kind of agony aunt where people would write into us in a to a kind of newspaper column saying something like, dear book doctor, I have a problem. My sister's just run away with my husband. Give me a book to read that will cheer me up. Or, dear book doctor, my mum is very ill and I want to give her something to read to cheer her up and I want something for me to read to cheer me up. And we thought that that would be a really great way of being a kind of agony aunt in a newspaper. So we had that concept back in our 20s and we used to talk about it a lot and say let's do this one day but Susan became a novelist and she wrote two novels which were very successful called Sunset Over Chocolate Mountains and The Voices that's Susan Elderkin uh, who was the author my friend and meanwhile I also became an artist and I've been painting ever since but while I was, I'm just showing you my painting in the background there. You can see more of my paintings, by the way, on my website, ellabertu.com. Feel free to have a look. And we got distracted from this idea of being book doctors and also didn't quite know how to go about it because we were young and needed to make a living. And we sort of shelved the idea for a while but during that time, while I was painting, I spent all my time listening to audiobooks as a way of keeping up with the books that I could be missing. So I became obsessed with listening to audiobooks. And that is something that I still do as a great way of managing to absorb literature, more of which later. Anyway, Susan worked in publishing, wrote her novels, and then we both bumped into someone called Alain de Botton uh, back in 2007 when he was starting an institution called the School of Life, which he opened in a lovely part of Bloomsbury in London. And that's a place where people can go to do courses about how to cope with death, how to be single, how to cope with your family, various philosophical issues, how to have a career that is meaningful to you, and so on. So that's the School of Life. And when we bumped into Alain de Botton, who was starting off this place, we said to him, what do you think about this idea of bibliotherapy? We could be book doctors at the School of Life. And he said, what an excellent idea. He knew all about bibliotherapy because he had written a book called How Proust Can Save Your Life. And he was already a keen proponent, proponent of the joys of bibliotherapy. Uh, 
which leads me back to the earlier thought that me and Susan thought that we'd invented the whole idea of bibliotherapy. In fact, we didn't invent it. It was talked about probably more than 2000 years ago. Plato was one of the first people to mention the idea of bibliotherapy. But in his day, in the days of the ancient Greeks, they were using drama as bibliotherapy rather than novels because novels hadn't actually been written at that point. But the ancient Greeks knew all about using art as a form of medicine. And they used to build their hospitals next to theatres so that people who were sick could use drama and art as a form of medicine. And those ancient Greeks knew a thing or two because they realised that art was just as healing in some ways as traditional medicine. Bibliotherapy was actually used over the next few hundred years in various different ways, though it was never really called by that term. But in the 1970s, doctors used to give books to children who were experiencing difficulties at home, and they very consciously used that as a form of bibliotherapy. Also, people coming back from the Second World War were given books as therapy, and they tended to be given Jane Austen novels, which is quite an interesting thought, because we wouldn't necessarily give Jane Austen to people experiencing shell shock. But I think the idea behind that was that soldiers coming back from the war needed something tangible and reliable and safe as a world to escape into. And Jane Austen, in a way, provides all those things because Jane's, Jane Austen's world is a world of social decorum, predictability in some ways, and it's a very civilised world compared to the world that those soldiers were returning from. So bibliotherapy was used then, but no one has really used bibliotherapy in quite the same way that me and Susan decided to use the service when we took it to the School of Life. And we invented our own particular way of using bibliotherapy in conjunction with Alain de Botton. And we started the service back in 2008. And the way it works is that people come to us through the School of Life, they find us on the web, and they subscribe to the service and send us an email. And we then send them a questionnaire, which the client fills in, which is all about their reading habits, their reading issues, if they have any. So it's kind of what do you read? Why do you read? When do you read? How do you read? Are there any particular types of books that you love? Are there any particular kinds of books that you hate? Are there any reasons that you can't read as much as you'd like? In other words, do you have any reading issues or reading ailments? So we ask all those questions on the questionnaire. And we also ask questions such as, are there any particular issues going on in your life at the moment? Are you single, married, divorced? Do you have children? Where do you want to be in 10 years time? Is anything preoccupying you right now? So the questionnaire is a means of getting to know the client. And we then make a date to meet the person. In the good old days, we used to meet them face to face at the School of Life where they have a consulting room. We still do that in theory. But nowadays, most of our sessions happen virtually. So we meet our client over Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or similar or good old telephone. And we then go through the questionnaire that the client has already filled in. And we expand on the questionnaire that the client has already given us some answers to. So we get to know the client during the space of 45 minutes up to an hour. And it's a one-to-one -one session. I'm saying we because we do have three bibliotherapists at the School of Life. So you always see one of us. And in fact, there's another amazing bibliotherapist in our very village, 
Charlotte Raby, who worked with me at the School of Life for a time. And she's now doing other amazing things with books and the world of children's literature. So we had the joy of working together as well. So bibliotherapy is uh, to continue with the explanation of how it works when I do my sessions at the School of Life or virtually. We, we go through the questionnaire and expand on those answers one to one over a period of 45 minutes to an hour. And then I hopefully have an idea of where the client is with their reading and where they want to go with their reading. And I then send them a prescription of reading, which will be six books. And it's not just a list of books. It's also an explanation of why you should read those particular books at this time in your life. So the books will be a combination of books to expand your reading horizons, books to help you with particular issues and books to entertain and provide escapism, perhaps. But it all really depends every time on the client as to whether they do have particular issues. But one important thing is that I almost always prescribe fiction because I'm a huge believer that fiction has the power to heal and change and transform by using catharsis. Because if you enter into the world of a novel, you become the characters, if it's a brilliant novel, you become the narrator, you take on their consciousness, and you actually affect a sea change through experiencing the trials and tribulations that the characters experience. But besides all that, you can also just escape into fiction and have a fantastic time surfing the wave of someone else's life. So me and my fellow bibliotherapists are massive believers in the joys of fiction. We also do sometimes prescribe non-fiction, memoir, autobiography, literary non-fiction, and so on. But we tend to feel that most clients can find non-fiction for themselves. So if they're looking for self-help books, for instance, they're quite easy to find because they normally give you lots of clues about what they're about. Whereas fiction isn't so easy to find if you don't know what you're looking for. So that's why bibliotherapists can be so helpful, because we can point you in the right direction of particular books. And we have to know all types of genres. So I love reading everything from literary fiction to science fiction to children's fiction to historical fiction to magical realism, and so on. And I must admit, I do a huge amount of my reading via audio because I am frequently multitasking, not least when I'm painting. That's when I'm listening to books. So Susan and I at the School of Life did our bibliotherapy services for about five years before we began to think maybe it would be rather joyous to write down some of the things that we'd gleaned through meeting so many clients in a book. And we realised that by 2011, we had already met probably about 3,000 clients, not just one-to-one at the School of Life or virtually, but also by going to festivals, because we went to lots of festivals, from Latitude Festival to Wilderness Festival, to festivals around the world in Sydney and Sicily and Jaipur. And when we went to festivals, we took an ambulance with us and dressed up as doctors. People came into our literary ambulance and we gave them literary cures. And each of those sessions would probably only take 10 to 15 minutes. So we got to know people very quickly. They told us their innermost problems and we would then prescribe them, hopefully, their perfect book. So we started to think about how to put this into a book and we sat down and wrote down all of the ailments that we could think of from broken heart to depression to um, 
d- to broken china, stubbed toe, and so on. So we we had a lot of serious ailments and also a lot of more light-hearted ailments. And we thought not least about ailments that just come to mind, but also ailments that came to mind because, because of a particular book that we'd read about such things in. And we then put down all the books that we thought would be perfect cures for those issues, which could be cures for heartbreak, cures for depression, cures for greed, cures for procrastination, and so on. And the result was the novel Cure, which is published by Canongate. It's subtitled An A to Z of Literary Remedies. And in this book, you can look up any ailment from being exceptionally brainy to breaking up to fear of confrontation to DIY, some would say that's an ailment, flatulence, searching for happiness, losing your job, optimism, some people call that an ailment, others don't, Uh, mental stagnation and so on. And each of these has a cure in the form of a novel. And normally each cure is just one book and it gives you the, it describes what the ailment is it then tells you what book we're suggesting as a cure for it. And uh, we then say how this book is going to be a good cure. We also put in this book a lot of what we call reading ailments, which have this slightly different background for the page. And they might be something like being put off by the hype, um, which stops you reading a book, or having too many children to have time to read, having a non-reading partner, uh, being distracted by the internet, and so on. So we have cures for all of those ailments in this book, and we had a lot of fun writing that book. After writing it, we then um, had quite an exciting whirl around the world, going to literary festivals, talking about it. And as it was a success, we then decided to write another one for children. So this one, sorry about the glare, is called The Story Cure, which is subtitled An A to Z of Books to Keep Kids Happy, Healthy and Wise. And this is the same idea as the novel Cure, but it's all about ailments that children have and how to help to cure them. So this has ailments from death of a loved one, to appendicitis, getting into arguments, wondering if there is a God, having to wear glasses, being spoilt, fear of vegetables, violence, and so on. And this book is like the novel Cure. It works in the same way. So you can look up any ailment and find a cure for it in the form of a book. But it is a little bit different because it's got three different age groups in it. It goes from naught to 18 in terms of literature. So each of the ailments has a different cure for different age groups. So the age groups are uh, toddlers or sort of non-reading children. Uh, Then we have picture books, then we have chapter books, and then we have young adult. And with each of the cures, we might have three different books or even four different books, which would suit the different age groups. Also, some of the books, um, some of the ailments are relevant to particular age groups, such as acne would be a teenage ailment. Pocket money lack of would be an ailment relevant to all age groups, probably. Um, fascination with poo and pee might be one which is more for the younger kids being spoiled is one probably for the younger kids too so each of the different ailments has different cures uh, in the form of different books and we found picture books chapter books 
some graphic novels and also young adult books. So there's a lot of young adult books in here too. And when we wrote this book, Susan Alderkin was based in the States and I was based in the UK. So we found a lot of different books relevant to different children in both the States and the UK. So it's quite a global kind of book, The Story Cure, as was The Novel Cure too. In fact, The Novel Cure maybe was even more wide, wide ranging. So I will answer some of these questions that are coming in shortly. But before I do, I will just um, mention also my other book, which is The Art of Mindful Reading. So both of those books, The Novel Cure and The Story Cure, were written with Susan Elderkin. But this one was one that I wrote by myself. And it's part of this beautiful series of leaping hair books, which are called The Mindful Books, because they produced all these lovely books such as The Art of Mindful Baking, The Art of Mindful Drawing, The Art of Mindful Swimming, I think is one of them. And here we have The Art of Mindful Reading, Embracing the Wisdom of Words. And this was a book that I also hugely enjoyed writing. In a way, it relates very much to some of the uh, issues that we talked about in The Novel Cure as well. Uh, which were to do with the reading ailments that we discussed earlier, because what I wanted to do in this book is to help people think about how they could get more out of their reading in various ways. So the chapters are all um, things like lose yourself in a book, reading like a child, sharing the joy of reading, find yourself in a book, and so on. And I really wanted to help people to delve more deeply into how to read more, how to get more out of reading, and how to read more mindfully. Um, so some of the questions I ask in the book are, what kind of a reader are you? And if you are a particular kind, kind type of reader, how can you get more out of your reading? So I'll just give you a little bit of an example from this book um, of one of the things that I talk about. And this also gives you a glimpse into some of the things that I talk about often with bibliotherapy clients. Um, so this section is from Lose Yourself in a Book. Creating a reading nook. What reader does not crave a reading nook? A space just for them where they can curl up with a good book for hours on end, uninterrupted by phone, man or beast. Every reader should have their own nook and it is far easier to create than you might imagine. Imagine a place where you can retreat from the world with a good book. A place where no one else can find you unless you want to be found where you feel safe and where you can lose yourself in a book. Now, having imagined it, you need to create it. Before you start, think about where is the best place to escape into your reading world most mindfully. You will need a place that's quiet, calm and uncluttered. If you live in a house with lots of other people, children, dogs, housemates, try to make your nook in a place where they won't disturb you. Consider putting a curtain in front of it or even a screen so that you can stay behind it for those vital minutes or hours of reading replenishment. A canopy can also be created using a hoop and some light fabric, cocooning you in your world of words. Make your nook anywhere in your house, halfway up the stairs on a landing, an improvised day bed in a study, in a hanging chair near a fire, or simply in the corner of a room, where you can put cosy cushions, a bookshelf, a platform for a cup of tea, and a nice rug to sit or lie on. Spend some time making your reading nook irresistible. Would you prefer a beanbag, a pile of cushions, or a favourite chair to sit on? Perhaps you can make a bespoke seating arrangement within an alcove or a bay window, like Jane Eyre's reading spot behind the curtains in the Reed's living room, a sanctuary from the household around her. 
Make it cosy, a place where you can curl up comfortably with everything you need to hand. It goes on and I won't carry on, but I wonder if any of you listeners do have a reading nook yourselves. You can see mine behind me. It's a hanging chair, which I do particularly love, I must say. And um, I was given it as a birthday present and it is now where I go to hide and read. And I sometimes put a blanket over it so that I can be even more hidden. But actually the joy of that chair is that it can go outside as well. And I do also talk in this book about creating an outdoor nook. I'll just read you a little bit of that. If you're lucky enough to have a tree house, you could make your reading nook in there. In a warm climate, fill the nook with cushions, perhaps a soft blanket to put around you if a chill develops. And again, you must have that vital shelf for a cocktail, juice, or glass of wine. This shelf could be a natural one formed by branches or a shelf in a grassy bank, or you could construct it from natural materials. For the reading spot itself, you could use a hammock or create a reading orb using willow or carefully steamed hardwood. Tents are also a possibility, as are swinging chairs. Or you can make a temporary reading spot with just a rug, cushions and a canopy for shade. Encourage your family to make their own reading nooks outside and on Sundays spend an hour or two out there with them, all absorbed in your own books or reading aloud from one book together. This will hopefully become a habit and everyone will love their outside reading time and so on. I wonder if any of you have reading nooks indoors or outdoors. If you don't, I would hugely recommend it. And that idea that I was just mentioning about having outdoor reading time with your family is something that I do very much urge people to do, uh, not necessarily outside, but every weekend to try and have a Victorian reading hour when you decide as a family that you're going to turn off your Wi-Fi and spend an hour just reading. And this may uh, be met with horror initially. Many a child is not going to be thrilled by having to turn off their Wi-Fi and sit and read. But if you start it early when the children are quite little, if you can, and make it seem like something that just happens every Saturday or Sunday between two and three, then it's something that can become a habit and your children will surely end up loving it. I have met quite a few clients who I've urged to do this and it's actually ended up being a lovely thing that has become far, part of their family folklore. And it's also something you can do when, you're, when your children are very little. They could be uh, just sitting with a picture book or they could be playing with Bananagram's letters or drawing from pictures in a book and so on. It just means that they're interacting with books while you parents are reading. And it has the joint uh, attractions of giving you time to read, which you probably don't have enough in your life, but giving you some peace and quiet, and also giving the family an opportunity to create this lovely habit. Uh, and it's a great thing to do, not just for families, but for single people and couples to make yourself have that time when you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to turn off the Wi-Fi, I'm going to sit and read for half an hour or an hour, and that would be special reading time. So I really recommend that, and I think that's an excellent thing to do. One other thing I want to mention, um, thinking of those kind of ideas and some of the ones that come into the art of mindful reading is the idea of if you're too fidgety to read, which I know some people are, and not just kids, adults too, you can actually do things while reading. So I am a great proponent of hula hooping while reading. 
And I would demonstrate it for you now, but I don't actually have the space, sadly, in my room. But you can go and look on my Instagram or on my website and you could see uh, I can demonstrate there hula hooping while reading. You can also go out on a boat on a river or lake and lie there reading. You could climb a tree and sit there reading. Uh, and I'd love to hear any of your suggestions for doing things while reading too, if you've done anything unusual while reading. Uh, but some people would think that's a bit mad, but I do know a lot of people who do walk around while reading a book and others who like to do things that enable them to fidget in a way while they're reading. And it's a method of stilling your mind somehow, a bit like having a fidget spinner, which helps you to concentrate on the book while your body is doing something else. So try that, try doing things while reading if you find it difficult to sit still and read, which also leads me to talk a little bit more about audiobooks. There's a question here from Danielle, thanks for sending one in, saying, I know you said that you use audiobooks a lot. What would you say is better, paper books or digital ebooks, or does it not make a difference? That's a really good question. I actually think that it's really whatever works best for you. I must admit that tangible books, I feel, are more memorable because of the fact that you touch the book, you smell the book, you have that physical reality which is different to when you just have an ebook. It's lots of people do love ebooks and obviously do remember them. There's the fact that you can highlight ebooks, which is a great thing. They're very accessible. You can easily uh, rifle through your library on your ebook collection. All of those are great things. And I'm by no means knocking those ebooks. However, I do think a tangible book that you can stroke and see the cover is a bit more memorable. And that does also lead me to talk about the idea of keeping a reading notebook. But another part of the question before I talk about the reading notebook is audio. So is audio as good as reading, many people ask. And lots of people tend to think, tend to slightly dismiss audio because they feel it's not as real a habit as reading. But I would completely completely disagree. Audio is just as good as reading because you actually spend more time with an audio book quite often than you would with a physical book that you're reading because listening to an audio book can be slower than reading a real book uh, I don't want to say real book, I mean a physical book, because an audiobook is spoken in the voice of the narrator, and that's often slower than your reading speed when you're reading with your eyes. Also, it very much depends on what kind of reader you are. You might be an audio kind of reader who is naturally more inclined to listen and to take things in through listening than a visual kind of reader. And I do have a little exercise in this book to help you discover what kind of a reader you are, whether you're more of uh, audio or a visual or a kinesthetic kind of reader. So have a look at my uh, book, The Art of Mindful Reading, to find out what kind of reader you are. But all in all, I would say audio is just as good and ebooks are also just as good, but I think having a tangible book does help you to remember as well. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about keeping a reading notebook, because that's something else that I very much recommend in both The Novel Cure and The Art of Mindful Reading. And whenever I speak to any bibliotherapy client, I say, keep a reading notebook, because it's a lovely thing to do. What you should do is get hold of a nice uh, leather bound book or 
equivalent, something that you love as a book that feels nice and looks nice and is pleasing to you. And then whenever you finish reading a book, while you're in that period of mourning the loss of the book and wishing that you were still reading it and wondering what you're going to read next, that's when you should pick up your reading notebook and devote one page of your reading notebook to the book that you've just read. So that's a good reason to not get a book that's too big. Get one that's small enough to not be intimidating. Get one which you can ideally carry around with you so that whenever you do finish a book, you can just pick up your reading notebook and quickly write in it during that moment when it's all very fresh in your mind. And you should write in your reading notebook the title of the book, the author, the date you finished reading it, the place you were when you read it, because that will bring back lots of memories about the book. Obviously, at the moment, we're not traveling around very much, but in the normal course of things, you might be reading a book on a train, on a plane to another country, or visiting relatives, staying at a friend's house, or simply in your own house or back garden. But all of those things are worth noting because one day you'll look back on your reading notebook and think, oh, I read that book um, in 2020 in the middle of lockdown in a field by the stream at the back of Hurstpier Point. And I clearly remember reading it there at that moment. Your mind will be prompted by the details of where you read it to remember what happened in the book and what was happening in your life at the time. So writing all those details in your reading notebook is really helpful, as well as then jotting down a few thoughts about the book itself. Did you like the book? Did you hate it? Did you find the narrator annoying? Did you wish that character hadn't died at the end? Uh, was there anyone in the novel or piece of nonfiction that resonated with you very heavily? Was there someone that made you think of a relative of yours or your parents? Were there any particularly strong events that really gave you a jolt? So any of those things could be noted in your reading notebook. And then you will have that reading notebook forever and be able to look back on it and you will probably use one of those notebooks over a few years. But by the time you're 90, you'll have a lovely collection of those notebooks, which you can share with uh, anyone that you want to. And they will be inspired by your amazing reading habits. But apart from that, it's a great way of actually cementing in your mind the books that you have just read. And that act of writing in the notebook is a tangible way of helping you to remember what happened in the book. So I'm going to come to some of these questions here. Um, one of them is, have you noticed any new reading habits during lockdown? Which is an excellent question. It um, has varied hugely. I did notice that one of the first things that people seemed to do was to read a lot of dystopian fiction, which was an interesting issue. And I think people felt like they were suddenly living in a dystopian novel and they wondered whether they might learn or glean something from reading all about similar situations. So I did have a few clients, particularly in America, who hold themselves up with a year's supply of tinned food and 20 dystopian novels, and they wanted more ideas from me about more dystopian novels to think about ways of surviving dire situations. And some of those people definitely really enjoyed reading dystopian fiction, which is another question that's come in do you think reading dystopian fiction is helpful right now? Well, the two are related. So lots of people did start reading dystopian fiction. And I think they did actually find it helpful at the start. But I think as the lockdown has continued, people have 
as a general rule, not been so keen on reading dystopian fiction. They've wanted to read more positive, happy, perhaps fiction from a different era, pre technology even. So I have noticed a lot of people going back to classics and also going back to childhood fiction that they could, in a way, escape into a safe place of books that they loved when they were children. And I've noticed another question or comment that's come in, thank you, from Margaret saying, I invariably go back to Jane Austen when I need comfort the familiarity is reassuring. Do you ever suggest that to your clients? Yes, I do. Jane Austen is amazingly comforting. And as I was saying at the beginning of this session, a lot of um, soldiers coming back from the Second World War were given Jane Austen to read as a form of comfort themselves. And I do meet a lot of clients who regularly read Jane Austen on a yearly basis as a way of seeking comfort, but also as a way of touching base with themselves. Because I think when you read books that you first read in your youth or teens or childhood, then you time travel back to that person that you were when you first read the book. So by reading a Jane Austen novel, for instance, you are teleported back to your younger self and you in a way touch base or shake hands with that younger younger person that's what one of my clients recently said to me that when they read old books that they loved as children they were felt like they were shaking hands with their younger self and I think that's a lovely idea and I very much recommend that people should go back to uh, reading books that they read in younger, happier times. And a lot of people have been doing that. I've also been recommending some children's books to people if they haven't previously read them. So a book like The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett is a wonderfully comforting, optimistic, hopeful, positive book, which I think is great for people to read at any age. And definitely at this particular time because it's all about getting your fingers in the soil and encouraging new life in a way facing your fears because of the aspect of the book which is all about the boy who's a hypochondriac I won't give away the story just in case people haven't read it but The Secret Garden would be a book I would definitely say people should go back to and children's books are definitely something that a lot of people have been rereading as adults during this lockdown period. And I think children also have been needing a particular kind of comfort read. And that really varies on the child. But some of the most comforting reads that I always recommend and love are the Moomin books by Tove Janssen which are all about little creatures living in the woods in Finland. And they really have a pretty idyllic life in those woods, but they're very quirky, they're very humorous, and they're very gentle and lovely, but with enough drama to keep you going. Um, there's a, I could say a lot more about reading during lockdown, but I have got a couple of other exciting questions. So. Someone has asked, can you recommend a book for budding authors? Well, that's a very interesting question, and it very much depends on what they're writing. But Stephen King's book on writing is absolutely brilliant. And a lot of people I know who are writers have loved it and been very inspired by it because it's a book which talks about Stephen King's own experience as a writer and his experience of getting many, many rejections, but still persevering and carrying on. And it has really helped him uh, be, it. well, it's helped people reading about his experience, carry on, pr- 
pressing on and not giving up. And I know a lot of successful authors who were inspired by him. Another great book for budding authors is Dodie Smith's I Capture the Castle. So Dodie Smith wrote 101 Dalmatians and she is a really fabulous writer. And her book, I Capture the Castle, is a brilliant book for anyone at any stage of life. But it is actually brilliant for budding authors because she is really describing how she became an author in that novel because it's about her being 17. Uh, It starts off with the brilliant line, I write this in the kitchen sink and she has her feet in the kitchen sink when she starts writing the book and it's all about how she captures different aspects of her life on paper and it's actually a fantastic story about love and romance and her father having writer's block and being stuck. And there's a lot of very funny family anecdotes going on. It is a novel, but it's also really inspiring for anyone that wants to be a writer because it makes you feel like anything is possible and that you can indeed be a writer um, if you are good at observing things. So there's another couple of questions I'll try and answer before we come to an end. Can you recommend books for parents who are having to deal with teenagers? That's a great question and particularly relevant and important at this time of lockdown. So one of my favourite books for parents dealing with teenagers is, it's going to hopefully come back to me, the title. I think it's called A Banshee in the House and it's by Anne Fine. I'm going to try and look it up in The Story Cure because I know it's in there, which is actually a book for teenagers, but it's about a girl who is who suddenly becomes an absolute nightmare when she hits 13 and she drives her parents completely up the wall and becomes, as her mum puts it, a banshee. And it's absolutely hilarious and unbearable. Oh, here we go. It's called The Book of the Banshee by Anne Fine. And it's very, very funny. And for me, it actually really helped me see my own teenagers in a different light because it shows the sudden flip that can happen with delightful, gorgeous children who love you and then suddenly become hideously grumpy, unbearable teenagers. And the book, The Book of the Banshee, is one that will make you laugh and see that teenager in a different perspective. And it also does show the teenager and the parents, particularly the mother, going through uh, a nightmare phase but it's temporary and it all comes good in the end. And I think that is a lovely book, which um, really makes you feel a lot better and makes you feel like anyone could be in that situation. So that is a good question. And anyone who is in that situation, feel free to send me a message on Facebook or to my email that's ellabear2 at gmail.com and I can give you some recommendations and tips or you can have a look in the story cure for helpful ideas. In this book there's also lots of lists of books, um, lists of books for people with different obsessions, so kids who are obsessed with space, kids who are obsessed with uh, horses, kids who are obsessed with fairies, kids who are obsessed with dinosaurs and so on. Um, And there's also cures for parents having particular issues in this book too. So you might find some answers to some of those questions in there. And then for your own um, adult issues, then you can have a look in the novel Cure. And do check out my website too, which is actually in the process of being reconstructed by my husband. So it may not be at its 
perfect moment right now, but it should be in a couple of weeks. And you can always send me messages there and book bibliotherapy sessions if you would like to have a personal bibliotherapy one-to-one session with me. And apart from that, I will see you around the village. And I would just like to say thanks so much for coming this evening and joining my bibliotherapy session. Uh, After me tonight, you're going to have Rachel Fryer, who is performing Variations Down the Line, which is going to be a fabulous musical evening. That's coming along at eight o'clock. So do join Rachel for that, which sounds fantastic. And people that are watching this uh, later on on YouTube, thanks so much for coming. Do um, send me any comments, thoughts or messages by email or find me on Instagram or Twitter. And I'm going to end the es- end the session there. But happy reading to you all. Thanks for coming. And I will see you soon, I hope. Enjoy the rest of the festival. <laughs>